Okay. So uh, where we had left off was actually uh, with the um, with the um, rookery building, and the next building to talk about was the Monadnock building from 1891, uh, also by Burnham and Root. The rookery had been also by Burnham and Root. Uh, Burnham and Root were really one of the most um, successful and prestigious firms in Chicago, and were uh, really significant leaders in the development of the Chicago School, and uh, got several buildings, including the Rookery that we saw last time, and uh, the Monadnock is also considered to be one of their uh, great masterpieces. So here's a view of it, uh, of the oldest part up front. There was actually an addition by Halliburton and Roche um, some years later that you can see way off here on the left that is similar in style, but is actually a little bit different. But uh, one of the most significant things about the Monadnock building is that it is uh, one of the tallest load-bearing masonry buildings in the world. And this is one of the great ironies about the Monadnock building is that it's, it's really almost the epitome of what a Chicago school high rise should be except it's load-bearing masonry. It doesn't have the cast iron or steel frame that is one of the great developments that occurs uh, with the development of the Chicago School. And the reason before that was actually because of the client. Uh, they were developers out of Boston, and they, they just didn't trust that newfangled uh, steel framing system that the uh, architects and engineers in Chicago had developed and they wanted a building that they knew would be built just right and would be sound and stand forever so they wanted they, they insisted that Burnham and Root design a load-bearing masonry building uh, and what's really kind of funny about this is that uh, they also didn't want a lot of extraneous ornament on it. Uh, Root, uh, John Wilborn Root, who was sort of the principal designer of the firm, uh, he kept designing these elaborate schemes with ornamentation and they would send it to Boston and the clients would look at it and they send it back and say, no, no, get, that, that costs too much money. Uh, strip that off of there. And they were, Root was getting very frustrated. And finally, uh, the story goes that Burnham one night just stayed in the office all night and just kind of re redesigned Root's base building by stripping away all the ornament and came up with this, uh, is my button on here? I don't know if you can see my button here. Here he is. Uh, designs this really stripped down, unornamented building that is uh, almost 50 years ahead of its time that when we talk about the, the second Chicago school in the 1950s, the Mesian influence of no ornamentation to it. And this view, here's a, here's a historic rendering of it where you can see it without that later addition on the end. And you can see how it has almost no ornamentation to it. And this corner view uh, shows, again, the lack of ornamentation to it but it also shows that Burnham and Root had, had really emphasized the construction of this by, by tapering the exterior walls. Um, with load-bearing masonry, you have, you know, you, the, the, the bottom of the building has to be the thickest to support the weight of the building above it. And, but at the very top, way up here, it doesn't have to support very much weight, so the walls don't have to be as thick. So when you stand at the corner, you can really see how the building tapers, and especially dramatically at the bottom, they really flare it out uh, to where we get to the ground floor, which has six foot thick walls, uh, which is really impractical. And in a way, this is a great building to have been built because it showed the utter impracticability of trying to build a high rise out of load bearing masonry that, you know, on the ground floor where, where developers would typically want to have, uh, you know, store, you know, retail storefronts with lots of plate glass windows. And all they can do are these small windows buried in six foot thick walls. 
and so it was became very quickly apparent to to everyone including the clients and the developers that this is not the future of high-rise construction that the cast iron and later steel framing would be the way to build these tall buildings and it's a great building if you uh, get the chances is that Dearborn and Jackson and you can go inside and it's a beautiful um, historic interiors you can walk down the corridors uh, the um, the stairwells are this beautiful ornamented uh, stair inside so the next building is Reliance Building, uh, started in 1891 and then finished in 1894-95. Uh, started again by Burnham and Root, uh, but then uh, John Root dies in 1891. And so when the building is completed, uh, the sort of the phase two, and I'll describe what that's about, uh, in 1894, uh, the, the firm is D.H. Burnham and Company and Charles Atwood is the main designer for uh, Burnham at that point, and he's the one who designs the tower part of the building. So here is how it looks today. This is at the corner of State and Washington, and this is really considered to be uh, really the epitome uh, that of a Chicago school building. This is a cast iron frame building. Uh, it uses the terracotta uh, uh, exterior walls as a curtain wall. We talked about the idea of a curtain wall that it's just hung or clad from the uh, from the iron frame inside. And I'll show you some details on how that works. And then this has very very large window openings, which again is something you can do when you have a curtain wall instead of load bearing masonry walls. So in 1891, this was a photo of the of the building as it was. This was uh, there was a, a post fire construction of four stories here at the corner, and William Hale, who was the developer, uh, um, wanted a new high rise, uh, but he had kind of a challenge in that he had upper floor office tenants who had longer term leases, but the ground floor uh, storefront, uh, the lease was up and he could, you know, evict or, or get rid of that tenant. Uh, and uh, developers are, are definitely go-to, go-go kind of people. They, you know, time is money and, and they want to get things done right away. They wanted it done yesterday. And so Hale tells Burnham and Root, well, let's just get started on this building. I can't get rid of those upper floor tenants, but we can we can shore up the building, we can excavate the foundations for this 15 story high rise, and I can put in the storefront and get that all ready. And then several years later, starting in 1894, in fact, when those leases expire, he's able to uh, get rid of those tenants and he can build the rest of the skyscraper. So it's, it's John Wilborn Root then who is designing the base of the building. And my next slide shows uh, how that is completed. And you see that it's a brown granite with bronze trim and filigree and huge plate glass windows, which is in contrast to what we just saw at the Manadnock building, where you had those tiny windows buried in really deep, thick walls. So this is the kind of ground floor that is available to you when you're using a cast iron frame and you can really uh, open up this uh, retail display window area. And ironically, uh, uh, Carson Peary Scott, the store that becomes famous just down the street for, uh, for its Chicago school building by Louis Sullivan, they, th this was actually their first uh, home in Chicago. And uh, I'll talk about Carson's, the, the main Carson building in a few minutes. What's somewhat interesting about this building too is that the storefront is is the brown granite, which is uh, the color that is more typical of the 1880s uh, and early 90s, uh, was brown brick and red brick and brown stone. But the up floors that get built in 1894 are uh, white and, or off white. And does anyone, uh, you can click on your mic if you, or hit the chat. Does anyone know why, uh, why the later building would be white instead of brown? Mm 
Anyone have an idea? What happens in 1893? The Chicago Fire? No, fire was 1897. Oh. 1893. Hmm. Anyone? Isn't it the World's Fair? Point? Yeah, oh. Emmett got it first. Uh, the Chicago uh, Columbian Exposition or World's Fair in 1893, uh, which we haven't learned about yet, but you're, you're probably heard of it, and that was known as the White City. And everything wanted, everybody wanted their buildings to be white after that. And we'll, we'll, when we talk about that, we'll, you'll see that more directly. And so uh, there's there's a dramatic shift in architecture that happens. Uh, right at that time. So this building is neat because it shows the pre-Columbian Exposition character of brown or dark red buildings and the post uh, fair of having white or off-white buildings. So here is an image of uh, Burnham and Atwood together in what uh, what an architect studio would have looked like in the 1890s. Lots of drafting tables and, and lamps hung low to try to get as much light. Uh, Burnham is standing there looking over drawings that uh, Atwood had prepared. Atwood was a, a really talented designer. He had come from the East Coast, uh, being recommended by McKimmead and White, a famous firm out of New York and extremely talented. He designed both the Tower of Reliance building, he designed another uh, a downtown Loop High Rise, the Fine Arts Building. He designed part of the Marshall Fields Building that still stands. And he designed what is now the Museum of Science and Industry, which was the Fine Arts Building at the Columbian Exposition. But he was a really troubled soul. Um, he had an opioid addiction and uh, was never able to manage that. And really was like a, it was like a shooting star that he uh, you know, glowed brightly for a short time, and then he uh, faded out, sadly, and was dead by 1896. So the Reliance Building, uh, after 1894, those upper floor tenants uh, were vacated, and Hale could finish off his building. Root had died in 1891. It was a, he had caught pneumonia uh, during a party that uh, Burnham and Root had hosted for uh, the, the various planners for the Columbian Exposition. Uh, Burnham and Root were the principal firm in charge of planning that fair. And Root hosted a, a party at his house on a cold January evening, and he stood out on his stoop, you know, um, sending off everybody uh, without a coat on and, and wound up getting pneumonia and died a few days later. And it was a really sad loss for architecture and Chicago architecture because he was incredibly talented. And you know, most everyone has heard of Louis Sullivan and how important he is uh, to, to modern architecture and to the high rise, and he is. Uh, but John Wellborn Root uh, was equally as, as important, but he's more obscure because he had died so young and we don't know the full impact of his influence. So uh, the slide I'm showing you here is the beginning of construction for the tower itself that Atwood designs. And we see down at the very bottom is the top of the scaffold over the storefront. So we're, we're not seeing the ground floor storefront, which of course had already been completed. Uh, so this right here would actually be the second floor. So we see the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth floor. And I want you to look at the date, July 16th, 1894. These are a series of postcards or uh, photos that got taken of the construction of this building. And I go to the next slide. Now look at the construction. Uh, you can count yourself how many floors have been built and framed up at this point. And look at the date, July 28th, two weeks later, Look how much they more than doubled the construction of floors on the building. That's how fast steel frame or cast iron frame can be built. All of these components are made off site. They're shipped onto the site uh, and put together quickly by iron workers. And this can be built really, really fast. 
And that is something that appeals to the developers who, again, time is money. They want something built really quickly uh, because they've got construction loans and they're, they're paying taxes on the property and so forth. And as soon as they can get their building built, they want tenants. They want that rental income as quickly as possible. So time is money uh, and is really important. And this iron frame construction uh, is the way to do that quickly. And again, if you compare back to the Monadnock building, that load bearing masonry, not only did we have the thick wall and the issue with that, but it takes a lot of time to lay all those bricks to allow that mortar to cure. It takes a lot, lot longer uh, to build a masonry building than it does uh, a steel frame building. And if we go to the next photo, uh, we see this is the top, at the very top here is the framing for the cornice, uh, which is 15 floors up, and we see that date is August 1st. So just a few more days, and they're finishing the, the, the framing of the building. Uh, really, really fast construction. And in fact, uh, publications at the time, like The Economist, had made note of the fact that no building in the city has ever been built so rapidly. This really uh, amazed people uh, who weren't familiar with architecture and construction and engineering how quickly a building could be built like this. And it also um, disturbed some people uh, when they start hanging the, the masonry cladding, and again, it's just hung off this iron frame. It's not built up, stacked up like you would with load-bearing masonry. And so uh, when they start hanging the terracotta, they could start down at the bottom. They could start also start working from the top, and they could actually meet in the middle. And that really blew people's minds who come in, uh, walk around the loop, and they'd see you know, terracotta or brick masonry hanging off a building. And uh, they really were, were amazed that uh, some sort of magical creation was happening there. So here is another photo dated November 8th, and all that terracotta cladding has been installed. So just a few months after the completion of the steel frame, they can clad the entire building, put the windows in. It's not quite done yet. You can see some um, some little sketches that they threw in on the image, photo image, and the interiors aren't quite done yet. But uh, to have that building framed and enclosed in just a matter of months uh, allows a, a really, really fast construction. So here's a detail of the exterior uh, with the terracotta cladding and uh, the Chicago window. This is a new term, something you'll need to know, the Chicago window. And it refers directly to this type of window that we see right here, especially. And what it is, is a big plate glass window in the center. Hopefully you can all see my little pointer moving around. And then it's flanked by two narrower double hung windows. And um, the, the reason for this is in the 1890s, electricity is brand new uh, and not very good. So um, there's not a lot of good lighting on the interior. So you need a lot of good natural light uh, coming in from the exterior. This big plate glass window allows lots of light to come in. But you also need ventilation because we don't have modern air conditioning systems and so forth. So on warm days, the only way to get ventilation is to open the window and try to get some fresh air in. So you still need some operable windows, but you also need those big, large plate glass windows. And um, this, this window configuration uh, became so popular in Chicago by Chicago architects that it it really became known as the Chicago window. So, if, uh, you know, as much as we talked about Palladio and the Palladian window in the first half of the semester, uh, the theme for this half of the semester will be, you know, the Chicago window. The other interesting thing you can see in detail here is that Atwood designed the exterior terracotta to be uh, a sort of neo-Gothic uh, style which uh, is kind of ironic because if you remember from your fall semester, the Gothic architecture is all about soaring, gaining, you know, emphasizing the verticality and allowing lots of light to come in. That was the that was what the Gothic architects were trying to achieve. And that's exactly what, you know, these Chicago school architects are trying to achieve here, the soaring verticality of a high rise and lots of light getting into the building. 
Here is a, a couple of details of the construction. And you can see on the right is uh, sort of the detail of the cast iron frame all put together. Uh, back at this time, they didn't have big sections of steel, what some people will call an I-beam or W section is the proper term. They didn't have that yet. They, they would make these in small components and they would have to rivet them all together. But it was still so much faster than trying to build a masonry. And you know, all of the building is supported by these columns and then you see a beam over here on the right and you see kind of an outrigger bracing on the left and that is supporting the curtain wall. And so the curtain wall you can see here the terracotta and terracotta is hollow. Uh, it's heavy because it's it's clay masonry, but because it's hollow, it's a lot lighter than a solid brick or certainly than, let's say, a, a solid piece of stone. And then right behind that is a layer or coursing of brick. And that brick is just sort of a solid backing wall. And if you notice up here at the top, it shows the dimension of the terracotta being four inches and the dimension of the brick wall and plaster being six inches. So the total thickness of the exterior wall cladding is 10 inches. That is really, really thin for masonry. And you certainly, you know, if you compare that to the six foot thick walls at the base of the Monadnock building, huge, huge difference. And this 10 inches can be consistent all the way up and down the building uh, versus having to make it thicker towards the bottom. And of course, as technologies improve and we go to glazed buildings instead of masonry cladding, then it gets down to, you know, an inch or less than that. So um, this is really right at the beginning of the modern curtain wall uh, high rise. This is a detail photo taken during the restoration of the exterior in the 1990s. And um, with the terracotta peeled away, you can see the black painted here. That is one of the cast iron posts. And you can see a lintel right here and down here. You can even see some of the rivets uh, as well on that. Behind, we see that brick masonry backup wall. And then we see the terracotta. Actually, on the left here, you can see that four-inch thick terracotta. And that's it. That's the, that's the way this whole building is constructed. The terracotta is hung from the cast iron frame with hooks. Uh, they were, there would be holes in these lintels. And you would bolt in a, uh, a hook that's sort of in the shape of a J. We call them J hooks, actually. And it sort of loops and, and clicks on to holes in the webbing of the terracotta. And you literally just sort of take it in your hands you, and you just hang it on those hooks. And then you point mortar in between the joints to keep, to keep the water out. Uh, and one of the problems is those hooks are, are are made out of iron or steel, and if they get wet, they 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 rust and corrode. And so a lot of times it'll either damage the terracotta, or you have to, or they get so eroded that you have to take the terracotta off and replace the hooks with stainless steel that won't uh, that won't uh, corrode, uh, and then uh, put the terracotta back on. So the next slide shows the floor plan of it as an office building. The Reliance was built as a professional sort of medical office, essentially. There were a lot of doctors and dentists that were the early tenants here. And that was another reason to have lots of window area, uh, because if you're Going to the dentist, uh, you know, you know how they bring in that big light right over your face when they're working on you. Well, they didn't have that capability back then, so the dentist needed as much light coming in through the windows as possible, so he didn't pull the wrong tooth or something. Uh, here we see on the top is the elevator bank. So of course, uh, the elevator, just as a reminder, that's one of the key developments, uh, technological developments that is necessary for high-rise buildings so that you can. Uh, easily get up and down however many floors. Uh, five or six stories used to be about as tall as we could build buildings, uh, not because of practical structural reasons, but because you know people just can't walk more than that uh, and and you know be efficient about it. But with an elevator, you can you know less than a minute you can be you know at the top of a 
15 story building, 40 story building, uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, then we see an interior corridor. There is a stair here in the open. Uh, back then they didn't have the fire codes that we have today. And so this was just an open stair and that was it. Uh, so that acts as a chimney and a fire. And so nowadays we of course would have fire stairs that are completely enclosed. Uh, but these, this was uh, this was the only staircase in the building at the time. And of course, having two two exits is a, a critical thing as well, in case one becomes blocked or, or filled with smoke. And there was only a single point of exit here, so uh, that sort of thing will change over time. But along the perimeter walls here, you see the offices, and often these offices would have glazed partitions. Uh, even in the corridor walls would be glazed and that would allow the light from the exterior to filter through into the inner offices and even into the inner corridor uh, to allow as much natural light as possible. A building and buildings from the 1890s like this, they, it did have electricity, uh, but you know, just electric light bulbs, you, you, you all seen those, you know, Edison bulbs that are really popular right now. They just don't put off very much light. And so uh, things could be very dim. Uh, the Reliance building also had gas lighting, which was really popular uh, in the 1880s and 90s. And uh, the story is that they put in both electric and gas lighting because they, the, the architect developers, they weren't sure whether gas would be gas lighting would be the wave of the future or electric lighting would be the wave of the future. So they hedged their bets and they put both in uh, as kind of a backstop against each other. This is a image of the, one of the corridors after the restoration in uh, around uh, 1998 uh, and it was converted into a hotel. Uh, it's a different hotel now, and I worked on this project. Uh, I didn't do the exterior restoration, but I, I was working on the team that helped convert this into a hotel. And so a number of these upper floor office corridors were intact. And you, you can see the cast iron stair that I was talking about on the left there. We were able to leave that open. Uh, we had to put a, a, a a sort of a fire curtain of water uh, around that sprinkler curtain uh, that will sort of keep smoke from penetrating through. But, and this is not an egress stair, there's two new modern stairs tucked away in the back corner so that uh, um, in the case of an emergency, you wouldn't take this stair, you'd go in one of the main fire stairs. But um, on the right, you can see uh, a typical 1890s historic office corridor with, you know, mahogany or oak woodwork. Uh, there's marble panels, and you can even see these windows, uh, you know, glazed walls that would have originally allowed that light to filter into the corridor. Of course, with hotel rooms, they they walled off behind it and back painted the glass, but uh, that was pretty typical of an office corridor. And and if you go in the Monadnock building, uh, you can see how that is still intact uh, throughout the Manadnock building. And you can also go in the Reliance building into the hotel as well and, and walk around if you want to. Uh, here is a historic photo and a um, after restoration photo of the lobby. This is the main entry lobby, uh, elevator lobby for the office building. This is, this is I worked on this. Um, it's one of the first projects I worked on when I started working for Gunny Harbo uh, here in Chicago. And all of all of this historic uh, iron grill work was gone. The marble ceiling and walls, all of that was gone. All we had were um, these historic photos and some drawings. So uh, we were able to recreate this uh, all from the historic photos and drawings and a few little fragments of things that we found buried in walls. And of course, the iron grill for the elevators, which would have been originally open um, for modern code uh, reasons uh, and to keep kids from losing fingers uh, as the elevator swooshes up and down. Uh, we, we put solid walls behind and then put the new uh, decorative grills on the face of that. And you can see the rich marble and some of the light fixtures and a new cast iron stair in the back there. All of that was recreated as part of the restoration effort. Here's an image of uh, an old, uh, this, this was the uh, bird cage elevator originally for this building. Uh, 
Uh, they called them bird cages uh, because that's what they looked like to people. And they were open grills as well. Uh, there would have been, this is just sitting on a floor, but it, of course it would have sat on a platform. There would have been uh, iron grill um, doors that would open and close. And this area on the right, that open area would have been for the control panels. And all of these elevators would have been operated by, by an employee, an, an elevator operator. So you would get on and you'd say, I'm going to the seventh floor. And the operator would, would take you up to the seventh floor. The Fine Arts Building on Michigan Avenue still has um, uh, open cage elevators with operators. Uh, so if you ever get a chance, you can go in there and, and check that out. Um, they, they put in extra uh, wire mesh to, to keep people from putting their hands to the grill, but uh, it's, it's pretty much like taking a, an old elevator ride. So uh, let's move on to, uh, to Louis Sullivan. And Actually, your, your first reading is going to be, this is a, a quote from that, which is the tall office building artistically considered. And Sullivan, who we talked about last time as well, uh, and uh, Sullivan and Ad Adler and Sullivan had designed the auditorium building. He was also a leader in developing the Chicago School and the high rise. And his, this quote uh, is one of the most in, in significant uh, pieces of literature to come out of the Chicago School and the development of, of how uh, a tall building should be designed. It is the pervading law of all things organic and inorganic, of all things physical and metaphysical, of all things human and all things superhuman, of all true manifestations of the head, of the heart, of the soul, that the life is recognizable in its expression, that form ever follows function. This is the law. And you, you've probably heard uh, the Sullivan quote, form follows function. This is where that derives from. And the meaning behind form follows function is that Sullivan and these other Chicago architects became to believe that the exterior expression of these high rises ought to reflect the fact that they are physically tall buildings, that they are modern industrial age buildings of steel frame and curtain walls and that that the architectural aesthetics ought to match the technological elements and if you remember back to the lecture i gave on the industrial revolution when we talked about say train stations um, for the most part they, they the architects of the time they built these you know sort of iron framed canopies over the train shed uh, but the sort of head house where you do your tickets and have offices and, and retail area, those were usually designed in some fanciful architectural style of, uh, that was popular and that didn't reflect the modern construction uh, that was behind it. And the same thing was happening in early high rises. Uh, they were just sort of stacking buildings, one, you know, one floor on top of another. And the concept that Sullivan and, and Root and others came up with is that a tall building ought to really express its verticality. And the image you're seeing here is of the Wainwright building, which is one of his most important early skyscrapers. This dates from 1891. It's actually in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, by Adler and Sullivan. So here we have a historic view of it. And again, you know, it's, it doesn't look very tall, you know, it's not a, a hugely soaring building, but for 1891, this is a tall building uh, and um, it, it really sets the precedent. You can, you can get taller and taller and use the same design principles. And uh, the way that the Wainwright building is constructed is Sullivan creates uh, essentially a solid base down at the bottom that anchors the building. And then he has uh, sort of a center shaft area where you see these vertical piers uninterrupted all the way up towards the very top. And then at the top of the building, you have a projecting cornice that uh, often would be highly decorative, especially with Louis Sullivan. And you notice that the piers uh, really create or, or emphasize that verticality and the windows are just sort of recessed back and tucked in behind 
so that everything begins to express the verticality of the building. So here's another quote out of this, uh, and I think you'll be seeing this as well. And what's the chief characteristic of the tall building? And at once we answer, it is lofty. The loftiness is to the artistic nature, its thrilling aspect. Um, and, and that's really what he emphasized in his writings and in his designs and the others like Ruud also did, is, is really creating this soaring verticality of, of architecture and not layering the horizontality that we might see in, uh, that we saw in the Renaissance, say, you know, with the horizontal uh, courses. So here's a modern view of it, uh, again, with that base, and you see uh, a horizontal band at the top of the base, but from there we have that uninterrupted vertical pier all the way to the top cornice of the building. And also notice this is in brown. This is basically brown brick and uh, brown terracotta. It is a curtain wall building. It looks solid, uh, but it is actually all hung from the iron frame, just like we saw with the Reliance building. And here was the original floor plan, especially if you look on the top is the typical office plan. So this is in a U shape. And uh, just like we saw with the sort of donut shape with a center light court at the Rookery or the really narrow building that we saw at the Reliance, uh, we have uh, lots of perimeter offices to allow as much light and ventilation as possible to every single office. We can't do those big floor plates yet with middle offices because there's, there's just no way to get light and ventilation to them. So we have a center bank of elevators right here at the, at the crooks of the U, and then a U-shaped corridor that goes down the two wings to allow um, full access. There's a detail of the cornice and the top of the building. Louis Sullivan was really famous for his ornamentation, and uh, Sullivan really eschewed historical ornamentation and wanted his uh, his designs and his ornament to be very modern. And he he especially was influenced by nature and created a lot of naturalistic ornamentation. So you see leaves and plant forms. And that would influence uh, his protege, who was working for him uh, at the time, which was Frank Lloyd Wright, who we'll be talking about very shortly. Here's another detail of some of that organic ornamentation on the building. So another example by a different firm is the Marquette Building in Chicago from 1895. This is by the firm Holabird and Roche. They were uh, another major architecture firm in Chicago doing the Chicago School. And show you the photo. Here's an historic view of it. You can see a lot of similarities to the Reliance and to the Wainwright Building here. Um, this is doesn't have quite the uh, emphasis of verticality that the Wainwright building does, but you can see it also doesn't sort of layer horizontally the way earlier buildings would have. We have this base down here with a solid cornice, and then we generally have these uninterrupted piers, uh, especially here on the center. You see essentially an uninterrupted pier. We have the Chicago window. In this case, there's a subdivision of the center but it's essentially a big plate glass window in the middle and flanked by those two narrower uh, double hung windows. And then a little more emphasized with some horizontal bands, but we have a significant cornice that caps the building at the very top. Next photo shows a modern view of this. This is at Dearborn and Adams, uh, right across from the Federal Plaza. And a uh, great prominent view. This is uh, standing, if you, if, uh, if you were to turn around if from the photographer's view here, you would be looking at the Monadnock building uh, down on the other corner. So this is a great spot in the loop. You've got the you know, Mesian Federal uh, Center. You've got the Monadnock building. You've got the Marquette building. Uh, it's, it's one of the best spots in, in Chicago to see this uh, great architecture. And I actually worked on the cornice restoration. This got removed in the probably the 1940s or 50s uh, completely. So I worked on recreating that cornice up there. 
So here's a detail. This is also brown. This is bef uh, it was, was designed before the Columbian Exposition. Uh, so it was done in brown brick and terracotta. And again, it looks solid. It, you know, if you look at this, you look at the Monadnock building and you didn't know, you, you might not realize that the Marquette building is, is a curtain wall and not solid masonry but uh, all of this is just a curtain wall hung from the iron framing, even though it looks really solid and sound and heavy, uh, it's actually not. And you get good view of uh, the Chicago windows on this building here. So one of the great examples of a Chicago school building is uh, what we often call Carson Perry Scott, but it was actually designed for the firm Schlesinger and Mayer. Uh, they were the department store originally there that were the clients. And then later they actually bankrupted themselves building their building. So uh, Carson Perry Scott took over and of course they're not there anymore either. Uh, so this is uh, designed in phases between 1899 and 1904 by Louis Sullivan. Uh, by this point, Sullivan had split his partnership with Adler and uh, was practicing on his own at this point. So here is a uh, modern view of it after the restoration effort uh, that I also worked on. Uh, we put the cornice back on this building. Uh, the uh, cast iron storefronts were restored. The terracotta and windows were restored. Pretty extensive effort. It was actually a 10-year project in the, in the 2000s for me. And you can compare, by the way, here is another brown you know, building from the 1890s, early 90s, before the Columbian Exposition. And then we have the white uh, terracotta influence that comes after the Columbian Exposition. So this building also uh, was built with cast iron framing uh, and later steel as steel became more prominent. Uh, so part of this is cast iron, part of it is steel. And here we see the corner uh, construction of the of the framing and here they're still working on the framing on the top but they've already started the terracotta cladding down below and that also shows you how quickly they can build these buildings you don't once you get up a few floors you can have the masons come in they can be working down low the steel workers are working up high and this building can be built much more quickly and it's built in phases because the department store who occupied these various buildings at the corner of State Madison, they wanted to stay open. So they would close off a section, demolish the building, build this high rise, open up the new store in there, and then they would demolish the, the section, uh, next section down the street. So we can see another view on the left of the building starting to be enclosed with the windows and the storefront almost done, and then a historic view on the right of it uh, as it looked about 1902. And then later there would be more additions down the, down the block on the right. So here's a couple more historic views as they're expanding down State Street. Later after 1904 actually, um, Sullivan is, is essentially fired and, and Daniel Burnham's company gets the commission to continue the construction of the building. Uh, it was quite a uh, to him for creating this masterpiece and then he doesn't even get to finish it. Uh, really kind of showed you the decline that Sullivan had uh, personally after about 1900. Uh, here's a corner view, uh, which is one of the best shots of this building. You see that soaring verticality that he talked about in his writings with these uninterrupted columns that go all the way up to this flared organic capital, uh, holding up this really deep cornice that extends out over the street. And you see a little bit of the decorative cast iron frame there. Slide. There we go. There's a detail of the cast iron after it was restored. Uh, this is a, a cast iron uh, framing again, it's curtain wall, it's hung off the steel frame and it's made to look like bronze. It was painted so that it would look like bronze, but it's actually cast iron. And you can see this is really some of the greatest ornamental work that Louis Sullivan ever created. And actually his, um, his uh, 
worker, uh, George Grant Elmsley, one of you will be studying him shortly in your second research assignment. He, he was really uh, worked on this and probably did most of the ornamentation. Here's uh, one of the drawings of the ornament. Let's get through this a little bit. Sullivan had written a book in the 1920s uh, on doing ornamentation. Some beautiful work. And you can see some of the actual ornamentation on the building. Uh, another project he worked on, 1898, is the Gage Building. Uh, this building was designed by Hollibrin and Roche, but uh, Sullivan was hired by them to design the facade for it. And here is what it looks like. This is right on Michigan Avenue across from Millennium Park. And this is one of his last major commissions. Uh, as I said, after 1900, he went through some personal struggles of his own and um, really declined in, in work and in his life. And he dies in the 1920s, kind of in poverty and obscurity. Uh, but what this is one of his last great high rises. And this, again, really emphasizes the, the design aesthetic that emerges out of the Chicago School, the idea of really having a soaring vertical building. These, these center piers are projecting and they come uninterrupted all the way up the height of the building, ending in this uh, bouquet of organic ornamentation at the very top. This doesn't have the Chicago window. It's just a bank of, of double hung windows within uh, but this still allows a lot of light in and can give you uh, lots of ventilation as well. Here's a detail of the upper floors and especially of that ornamentation uh, at the top of the piers. And a historic view showing the building. And I think next I have the storefront that he designed was very similar to that of the Carson Perry Scott building uh, with cast iron ornamented uh, spandrels on the right, or excuse me, on the left, we see an original one. This storefront was dismantled, I forget when, but sometime in the 20th century. And uh, some of these panels were salvaged and some of them are hanging. There's, there's some in the uh, main entry hall of the Art Institute. Uh, if you go up that grand stair and you see all the architectural ornament, you'll see some of these. Uh, there's some down at the University of Illinois in Champaign in their architecture building. And then we see on the right is a historic photo of, of the uh, retail entrance uh, and how ornamented that was. And unfortunately, it uh, has not been recreated. So uh, this is a link to a, a video that you can get on the YouTube page now. And so I won't click on that, but it's a neat uh, video from 1914 uh, taken from a dirigible, a hot air balloon that floats around the city and uh, shows you a little bit of what uh, the Chicago school, these, these famous high rises looked like at the time. It's a silent movie, of course, uh, but it's, it's fun to watch that. I think it's only about 10 or 15 minutes long. So if you're interested in that, uh, just from the nostalgia of, of what uh, dirigible flight might have been like, you can see uh, that aerial view of the city from that time. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to click off the recording.